Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a thank you, Ambassador uh, Bueller, for, for the introduction and for moderating the panel. Uh, thank you to the uh, Ludwig uh, Boltzmann Institute, Institute of Human Rights of the University of, of Vienna for, for the invitation and, um, and for organizing uh, this excellent event. Uh, and it's a particular honor, actually, to be uh, sharing this panel uh, with uh, Stephanie Bock and um, Astrid Reisinger uh, Corazzini, uh, who I've, I've known for, from previous events, previous interactions. And so it's a particular honor and, and privilege to, to be sharing this panel with such uh, excellent uh, scholars. Um, it's a, I, I, would, I, 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 I wish I could be there. Uh, that was the plan. Uh, the, my trip to the University of Vienna was actually the, 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 the first trip I had to cancel when COVID hit, right? This conference was initially planned for March of, of next, uh, last year uh, or, or something like that. And then, um, unfortunately, I cannot be in person now because I am in the middle of my semester of teaching. So going to, to Vienna now uh, would, have would have required for me to cancel more classes than I can, than I can cancel. I do want to say, um, that uh, it's a particular honor to be um, and, and pleasure to be presenting there because actually my grandfather and my grandmother, both of them studied at the University of, of Vienna about 100 years ago. Uh, and so uh, it's a particular pleasure to, to be able to participate uh, in an event uh, with this university. Um, Ambassador, I have 15, 20 minutes. That's what I have. 25, yes. 25. Okay, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a paper that uh, I've been working on. Um, it is a, it is a, uh, let me share a screen. Let me see if I can share a screen. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is a paper. Let me tell you a couple of things about this paper as an intro, introductory uh, matter. The first one is that uh, this is an interdisciplinary paper. Uh, meaning that uh, it is a paper that I've been working on with two pro professors of political science uh, here at UCLA, you know, the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where, I, where I teach, where I work, uh, professors Leslie Jones and uh, professors, Professor uh, Margaret uh, uh, Peters. Um, the, uh, well, this introductory part, um, uh, it's, I think, too, too superficial for, for this audience, right? But I am, the project basically is about universal jurisdiction um, prosecutions and specifically universal jurisdiction prosecutions of four types of crimes. Um, crimes against humanity, torture, war crimes, uh, and, uh, and genocide. So they, we are talking about, well, uh, these, these four crimes, right? Three of them cover as ICC crimes, right? Leaving, you know, aggression, aggression aside. Uh, and, um, and then torture, right? As, as a fourth, as an independent crime, right? And as a fourth crime that uh, the project refers to. The question we are interested in here, and this is where the interdisciplinarity, I think comes, uh, or one of the places where it comes very clearly is, not necessarily a normative question, even the type of normative questions that we as lawyers are used to, to explore, um, but rather a, a positive question that I think has normative implications, but it has to be uh, analyzed uh, on its own right, so to speak. And the question here is why do universal jurisdictions prosecutions happen? No, why they should happen, right? Or uh, either according to the law or according to justice, uh, but rather why do they happen, right? As, as, a, as a social phenomenon, right? We have prosecutions or, or, or complaints being presented, uh, initiated, et cetera. Why is it that uh, universal jurisdiction prosecutions happen? By universal jurisdiction, I mean essentially uh, um, uh, prosecutions and cases in which uh, the neither, well, in which the prosecuting, prosecuting state uh, didn't have a territorial active nationality, passive personality, or any other link 
to the crime in question, at least one of the crimes in question uh, in the case when the crime or crimes were, were committed. So uh, in order to, to explore this question, first, I should talk about this universal jurisdiction database. Uh, this is a database that I put together uh, initially in the years uh, 2009, 2010, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, in which uh, the, the database essentially tries to do a census of universal jurisdiction cases uh, around uh, the world. Um, when, when a case makes it to, to, the, to the database, well, first it has to be a universal jurisdiction case over one, at least one of the four crimes that I was mentioning earlier. Um, second, uh, as long as we have an indication that victims or, or, or NGOs or some other actor has ask authorities of a given state, right, to initiate a case, that case makes it to the database. It also makes it to the database cases that are investigated by authorities by their own motion. So for instance, uh, let's say a structural investigations in Germany, right? Or a, a investigations that have to do, like, perform, let's say in common law countries by royal commissions or governmental commissions, right? Or Nazi crimes, right? As they were, a number of them in the 80s and the and the 90s. Well, that those cases also make it to um, uh, to the database. The first case in the database is the Eichmann case, and the, the the data I'm going to present today basically has updated data until the end of 2019. So this is a database that uh, uh, I, I've been uh, updated several times. Uh, the, the, I've done this with with different different people, different in, even co-authors uh, in the past. Uh, this database that I am, I am uh, updated until the end of 2019, sorry, they were, you know, uh, uh, the ambassador was saying, uh, we hope that it's sunny in, in California and it is, but that means also that we have gardeners, okay? So there may be some background noise, I apologize if that's, that's happening. Uh, but the database uh, contains uh, 2,162 cases, uh, uh, universal jurisdiction cases from around the world, right? The idea is, of course, in any, in any project of this sort, there will be missing, missing data, uh, cases missed, because you know, it's very hard to cover the whole world, and they are, you know, some of these cases are not publicly known, etc. But uh, the idea here is that uh, to, to do a census in the sense that to try to identify every single uh, universal jurisdiction case over these, uh, over these crimes uh, um, uh, initiated, right, uh, anywhere, anywhere in the world. And so we have that number of them. This is a, a figure one is a, is a figure on, on initiations. Uh, by initiations, again, I refer here to essentially complaints, right, like an Anzeige. Uh, presented presented uh, uh, by victims, by, by uh, uh, NGOs or others, or cases initiated by authorities by their own motion. Uh, as you can see with the trend line, uh, initiations have been uh, going up uh, in universal jurisdiction uh, in uh, the last uh, 15 years uh, or so. Um, this is a, a, a figure on trials, on universal jurisdiction trials. And as you can see also here, universal jurisdiction trials have also been going up uh, quite substantially. Uh, this is a phenomenon that we explored with, with Mac Eason, one of the persons with whom I updated the database at some point, uh, called the quiet expansion of universal jurisdiction, in which we explore precisely uh, why, 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 well, this phenomenon that universal jurisdiction cases have been actually uh, uh, going up, uh, not down, as at some point, you know, some of the literature was suggesting, right, with kind of a rise and fall narrative about universal jurisdiction, they have been going up. And uh, actually, uh, we also explore in that paper the quiet expansion of universal jurisdiction in the European Journal of International Law, why this might be, this might be the case. Um, these are uh, initiations by prosecution, prosecuting a state. As you can see, Germany here is at the very top, 
to explain this number here, we are counting, it's important to, to realize that we are counting uh, here uh, the structural investigations or our best estimate of the structural investigations, right, of Syrian cases and also ISIS cases. We are including here also former Yugoslavia cases, right? There were about 170 plus uh, 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 cases related to the former Yugoslavia uh, in Germany, right, in the, in the 90s uh, and the early 2000s. Um, this is, uh, you see, first trial, and this is total number of trial. Uh, uh, Spain comes uh, second here, right, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, again, complaints or cases investigated by authorities by their own motion. You know, here, one of the largest uh, um, uh, cases in that regard uh, in Spain. Ahimo, pardon for interrupting you. Yeah. Um, we can unfortunately not see see your screen. So could you potentially try? Are you to... gonna see my screen? No, and we're trying our best to to handle it. But I think you have to share it with your computer, and then uh, we can. See. No, I thought I thought I was sorry. Thank you for that. Ah, you sh you should have told me that. Sometime. <laughs> I feel that now it's yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, 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 please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now you can see it. Now you can see it. Hello. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So sorry. This is then uh, the 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 line trend on initiations I was talking about earlier. This is. Uh, let me do the slideshow now. Let me then start this again. Sorry, there is there is something ha happening with the interface here. Um, let me stop share for a moment. Let me do the slide show first, see whether that, and now, okay. And now I'm going to share again. No, there is a, well, um, let me, let me just do it the way I was doing it. Okay. So um, um, this is this is the figure I was telling you about earlier. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing the, the screen. Uh, regarding initiation, these initiations, this is the one you see with the trend line I was talking about regarding trials. Uh, this is the table uh, I was just talking about uh, in terms of uh, prosecuting states, right? With Germany up here, right? The number of initiations, total number of initiations, total number of trials. And then I was talking about this thing. Um, okay, so uh, this is based on, a, sorry, I know that it's very small, the, the, the writing there because it's a big table, but basically this is by defendants' nationalities with now uh, Syria being the, the, um, the, the country, right? With more, more, more people uh, being, having been the, the, the target, right? Or the, or the subject, right? Of the universal jurisdiction complaint. Nazis, I take as a nationality, right, to kind of account for those World War II uh, 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 cases, right? And so that's the second largest group. The third one uh, is, is former Yugoslavia. The fourth one is Argentina uh, due to the, to the Spanish investigations back in the day, and the list continues. Let me, though, uh, get into um, the question that I am most interested in uh, to explore with you uh, today which is again, it's, it's a positive question. It's a question of why do universal jurisdiction uh, prosecutions happen? And in that regard, the literature, this is a question that the literature has explained, I think substantially less than uh, some of the normative questions uh, that, that are very important, right? Uh, and some of which were, were addressed by the previous uh, speakers. Um, um, but there are some explanatory variables there that have been suggested, some reasons for why these universal jurisdiction prosecutions happen. happen. There is, for instance, an international politics uh, variable here uh, that basically uh, it says, for instance, that universal jurisdiction prosecutions are driven by ne neocolonial dynamics, right? You know, that they are just a neo-colonial tool, right, to kind of prosecute, especially African African leaders, right, and especially by former former colonial powers. Uh, there is a second hypothesis that has been suggested, and I've done it in my own work, 
uh, on domestic politics being one of the drivers of universal jurisdiction. Why? Well, because um, um, local politicians, right? You know, local the, the local executive power, local legislature, etc., may have different sets of incentives to enable universal jurisdiction prosecutions in the first place, and then to uh, actually uh, uh, launch prosecutions or at least receive some complaints, as I was saying uh, earlier. There is a fourth hypothesis that one could explore and defend, and that has to do with preferences of a government. They are, they are even if universal jurisdiction in theory is a principle that any state may invoke, right? It is possible, according to this hypothesis, that some states and some governments in particular within a state uh, may be more committed to the idea of international justice than other governments, right? So even if, let's say, you know, Austria and Germany have a, 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 the, the ability, right, to launch universal jurisdiction investigations, right, or receive this type of cases, right? Is it that one of the states is more committed to international justice than, than the other, right? So that would be a third hypothesis of, that, that would explain why these prosecutions are uh, happening. There is a fourth hypothesis that has been um, articulated in, in the literature that talks essentially about transnational politics and the role of non-governmental uh, organizations. Um, so, um, uh, the, the idea here basically has to do with the role of NGOs, right, in launching universal jurisdiction prosecutions uh, in different places and try of trying to explain why universal jurisdictions happen in a certain place or more often in some places than in others based on the behavior of these transnational NGOs. The, the hypothesis that we want to defend uh, here, right, in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, ah, let me see if now works. Oh yeah, yeah, now I am happy. Okay, that we want to, to, um, to defend here is that actually one of the central drivers of universal jurisdiction prosecutions are migration patterns, um, uh, are migration patterns. And uh, the idea here is that essentially when people travel from their home state, right, or some other state to the to to other, but typically the home state where where these international crimes have happened to another state, right? Well, the more of the more people that travel to from 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 a, 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 a the territorial state where the atrocities took place to a, another state, the more likely it is that this third state a, a starts universal jurisdiction prosecutions. Why this is the case? Well, there are different mechanisms possible. A, a, I mentioned here a, a couple of them. A, one is that, a, well, a, the, um, well the, if, if they are people from a given country available in the, a, a universal jurisdiction state, that, that, that's, that's more likely to um, foster universal jurisdiction prosecutions because there will be defendants to prosecute right, because many states require the presence of the defendant to exercise universal jurisdiction, right, or for at the very least to launch a trial, right, against, against these defendants. Um, the, the availability of victims and witnesses, right, in the prosecuting state will also facilitate these type of prosecutions. And also the presence of a, a, a community of, 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 a, of emigres, right, in a given place, it may also make this more likely because these people may organize, may, may get organized politically, right? And they may then work together to try to bring cases uh, uh, to their, their receiving a state, a universal jurisdiction state uh, for things that happen back in their home, in their home country. Uh, we actually then uh, using uh, the, the existing literature and, and trying to use uh, um, uh, some statistical methods that I will I will show you. You know some of our our uh, our our results in that regard. We actually are testing four hypotheses, right? Using this data univer that, um, universal jurisdiction database that I, I have put together, and um, uh, some other databases that we use to test these hypotheses. 
The first hypothesis, which is our, our hypothesis, if you want, for this paper, is that a larger mass of migrants from the sending to the receiving state will increase the likelihood of a prosecution. The second hypothesis is that a higher magnitude of atrocities in the sending state will increase the likelihood of, um, of a prosecution. The, the third hypothesis is that a higher level of responsiveness in the receiving state will increase the likelihood of a prosecution, meaning that if a state again is more committed to international justice to prosecute this type of crimes, right, then more likely it is that there is a prosecution in that state. And the fourth hypothesis is that a, a higher prosecution cost in the receiving state will reduce the likelihood of a, 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 of a prosecution. We um, basically, what I have here is a measure of how um, um, how uh, how we how we it's a description of how we measure these different variables, how we measure migration, right, through these dyadic uh, variables, how we measure um, um, things like atrocities, right, the measures that we use for that, this political terror score, democracy uh, variable, and the like, uh, how we measure responsiveness. You see how, you know, if there is, a, if the receiving state is a democracy, what's the, 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 the the, whether the receiving state, for instance, has ratified the ICC statute. And then how uh, we measure costs, right, with different variables to try to measure costs. Uh, and then a number of control variables, including, for instance, former colony, former colony status, right? So uh, let me now show you um, our main models and our main results. Um, Sorry that it's not here. Can you see that the uh, PDF document with lots of numbers, the small numbers there? Yes, we can see it. Okay, one. Well. Okay, so these are our main. Uh, these are these are our uh, uh, main models, right? The main regressions that uh, that that uh, we are presenting, right, in this project. Essentially, as you can see here, we have migration, right, from sending a state to the receiving a state. And this is a, a, a variable that it's, a, it's positively correlated in a, in, a, in a statistically significant way, right? In the way we predicted in our, in, with our hypothesis, right? Meaning that the higher the number of migrants that go from, from, the, a receive, from a sending state to a receiving state, the more likely it is that that receiving state initiates some sort of universal jurisdiction prosecution. That happens uh, in uh, our four models. You know, some of, we have four models because, you know, for instance, this first model includes all cases. The second model here in, ex, includes only cases whose, that, that we know the name of the defendant, right? If we have some case that we don't know the name of the defendant, then we, uh, we don't include, uh, we don't include uh, uh, those cases in this second in this second model, and then uh, is this this refers these first two models refer to any universal jurisdiction prosecution, while this refers to the first uh, uh, universal jurisdiction prosecution in a given state. We see that in terms of atrocities uh, uh, for the second uh, hypothesis, right? The hypothesis that the larger the number of atrocities, the more likely it is that the universal jurisdiction prosecution is is initiated, they are uh, actually the results indicate a, a, a relationship between the two uh, in, 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 a, in the way we, the, this hypothesis will predict because essentially you see with the terror, with the terror score that I was, political terror score that I was uh, uh, saying uh, earlier, right? Essentially uh, the higher state is in the political terror score the more likely it is that there is a universal jurisdiction prosecution regarding uh, that, that state. And the other way around regarding democracy as another way to measure right, the level of atrocities because the lower the, the democracy level of a state, the more likely it is 
that there is a universal jurisdiction prosecution, right? You can see it here with the, with the, negative, with the negative coefficient. In terms of responsiveness, we do find a, a number of a, variables that measure responsiveness that also a, a comport in the, in the, in the um, predicted level. Let me just mention in the, in the benefit of time, I know that I am running out of it, that for instance, ratification of the Rome statute by a state, by a receiving state makes more likely that the state in question will start universal jurisdiction prosecutions. The, if a receiving state uh, enables victims or others, right, to be kind of private prosecutors in the criminal proceedings that also correlated with a higher uh, likelihood, right, of universal jurisdiction uh, uh, initiations. And then British origin correlates negatively with that. And that makes sense to us because it, it, oh, generally speaking, common law countries tend to give more discretion to the executive on which cases may get prosecuted and which, which not. And so the British origin, origin kind of captures this issue. Uh, let me very briefly just tell you a couple of things uh, about um, a, a initiation. Uh, well, about costs, uh, they are a couple of interesting things. First, if the sending a state is a major power, it's less likely that there is a universal jurisdiction prosecution. If a state has already initiated a case in the past, it's more likely that it initiates a second case in the future. And then finally, and with this, I'm going to, to finish at least with this part, um, um, we see how being a former colony uh, actually is not correlated with uh, 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 making more likely that the universal jurisdiction uh, uh, prosecution or complaint is going to take place regarding that colony. So that's an interesting finding given you know, some of the uh, arguments we see in, in the literature. Just to conclude, uh, let me go back if this interface allows me to, um, to here. And uh, let me just uh, uh, raise a couple of final, uh, final questions. Uh, one question is if there is truly a, a, a relationship, right, as our, our study indicates, uh, between migration flows and you, the likelihood of universal jurisdiction prosecution, a question to unpack further would be to identify the mechanisms, right, through which this actually happened. Uh, but from a more theoretical perspective, I think that this also interrogates a universal jurisdiction states in a number of ways. A, a years ago, I introduced this distinction between, uh, excuse me, between no, no say heaven versus global enforcer universal jurisdiction states. No say heaven states are states that exercise universal jurisdiction because they understand that their role within the universal jurisdiction regime is not to be a, a heaven, a, a place where international criminals may, 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 may stay, may find refuge, right? Um, but that's all the extent of their role. They don't have, a, a, it doesn't go beyond that. The global, universe, global enforcer universal jurisdiction state instead a, a, a finds that or considers that its role in the universal jurisdiction regime is to enforce human rights regardless of where a, a, these human rights violations have taken place. So I think the question of migration flows a, a also raises this question about what's the role of the state uh, within the universal jurisdiction regime. And finally, and with this, this is actually my very last comment. Another way in which this, uh, our results uh, uh, interrogate universal jurisdiction states is by asking them the following. Okay, if there is a relationship between migration flows and universal jurisdiction prosecutions, and it's more likely that there will be universal jurisdiction prosecutions, the higher the migration flows, why is it that universal jurisdiction states are exercising universal jurisdiction in these cases? Is it because they consider that victims that have emigrated there have a right to access to justice? And that relates actually to the presentation that Professor Dr. Bok was, was making. Or is it that the exercise of universal jurisdiction by the receiving state is just a way to exercise sovereign power is basically a way 
not, not to give access to victims, but actually to exclude uh, or neutralize uh, from or express, if you want, a, 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 again, relying on, on the, the presentation by, the, by a Professor Dr. Bock, a, a, that they are that these pe that people have, that have committed international crimes a, a, are not welcome in their territory. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a, any questions or comments a, that you may have.